This video is sponsored by Card Kingdom. You can find all the cards in this video in their store by using the links in the description below. Hi everyone, I'm Nita Hone. Earlier today, the full card gallery for Outlaws of Thunder Junction dropped, and that means it's time to start my limited set review for the format. Over the next week or so, I'll be evaluating every single card in the set to get you ready for your pre-release or the release of the set on Magic Arena. We're starting today with the multicolored and colorless cards. Multicolored is always a nice place to start because they do a good job of introducing us to the set's archetypes and mechanics, and they also tend to be some of the most powerful cards in the set. For each of these cards, I'll discuss how I think they'll perform in Limited, that means draft and sealed, and I'll punctuate each evaluation with a letter grade. If you're new to my set reviews and unsure of what my letter grades mean, you can find a guide in the description for this video. There are a few important things to keep in mind as I review these cards. First, because we're only talking about draft and sealed, I'm only going to be talking about cards that can be found in Play Boosters. Furthermore, I'm only looking at cards from the main set in this video. Play boosters in this set have a couple of different bonus sheets, not to mention special guests, and I'll cover those cards after we finish looking at the whole set. Second, these are my evaluations of these cards before actually playing with them, since the goal is to have my set review done in time for the pre-release, and that of course means I'll be wrong about some things. However, as the format comes into focus, I'll be doing videos where I discuss how things have actually turned out. Lastly, I want to remind you that there are some set review related perks for being a channel member or a patron. You get access to my ongoing set notes during preview season, and you'll also get a spreadsheet with all of my grades once a set review is complete. If those perks interest you, check out the description where you can find out how to support the channel using one of those methods. All right, without further ado, let's dive in with a look at the multicolored and colorless cards in Outlaws of Thunder Junction, and we'll be starting with multicolored. First, we've got Akul, the Unrepentant, which for two black and two red is a 5-5 legendary scorpion dragon rogue at rare. It's got flying and trample, and you can sack three other creatures to put a creature card from your hand onto the battlefield, activate only as a sorcery, and only once each turn. So this activated ability is honestly nothing special and limited. Having both the sacrifice fodder and a creature we're cheating into play just doesn't line up. So mostly you're getting a four mana 5-5 with flying and trample, which is pretty good, but the double black, double red casting cost is a problem. There's not a great chance you'll be casting this on turn four, for example. Still, it's intimidating at all stages of the game, so it's still pretty good, giving it a B minus. Next up, it's Annie Flash, the veteran, which for three generic, a red, a green, and a white, is a four or five human rogue at mythic rare. She's got flash. And when she enters the battlefield, if you cast her, return target permanent card with mana value three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. And when she becomes tapped, you exile the top two cards of your library, and you can play those cards this turn. So she's good. A six mana four five with flash that reanimates a cheap permanent is already very good. I mean, probably at least an A minus. And then she has this ability when she taps, which counts crewing vehicles and saddling mounts. Things we'll see, well, you know what a vehicle is, but we'll see mounts later in this video. And you can also just attack with her and basically draw two cards, which is kind of ridiculous. She's sort of hard to cast as a three color card in a set that's not really a three color set, though there is common fixing, but she's well worth splashing in your red green or your red white deck because she's insanely strong, going to take over the game most of the time when you play her, easily can give you a four for one, and that's just crazy, giving her an A. Next up, it's Annie Joins Up, which for one generic, a red, a green, and a white is a rare legendary enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, it deals five damage to target creature or planeswalker an opponent controls, and if a triggered ability of a legendary creature you control triggers, that ability triggers an additional time. There's a whole cycle of these, and they're a pretty fun callback to the various oaths that the good guys had with Oath of the Gatewatch. Anyway, you're mostly only playing this as a four mana spell that does five to something, which is an okay removal spell. There are some legendary creatures around, of course, including at Uncommon, but you not only need legendary creatures, you need legendary creatures with triggered abilities. So that part of the card, while it will come up on occasion, just isn't what you should be looking at when you're evaluating this card. Mostly we're talking about a kind of hard to cast removal spell that's pretty good, but not even that impressive, giving it a C plus. Next up, it's Assimilation Aegis, which for one generic, a blue and a white, is a mythic rare artifact equipment. When it enters the battlefield, you exile up to one target creature until Assimilation Aegis leaves the battlefield. When it becomes attached to a creature, for as long as it remains attached to it, that creature becomes a copy of a creature card exiled with it, and it has equipped for two generic. This is a neat design and also plenty powerful for limited. Even if it didn't have the equip part, you'd always play this card and feel good about it. Oblivion Ring effects are just really good. And if you happen to exile some really scary creature of your opponents, making your own creature a copy of that can be pretty insane. It'll be like rubbing salt in the wound. 
It's not quite a full-on mind control effect, but it'll feel similar sometimes. However, don't put too much weight into the idea that you'll always be upgrading your creature when you equip it. A lot of the time when you do, it'll only be a minor upgrade too. Still, it's an amazing card. I'm giving it a B plus. Next up, it's at Knife Point, which for one generic, a black and a red is an uncommon enchantment. As long as it's your turn, outlaws you control have first strike. Outlaw is a new creature category, and it includes assassins, mercenaries, pirates, rogues, and warlocks. So all of those have first strike as long as it's your turn. And whenever you commit a crime, this is another new mechanic. You commit a crime anytime you target something of your opponents, whether it's them or one of their permanents or cards in their graveyard. And when you do that, you get a 1-1 red mercenary creature token with tap, target creature you control gets plus one plus zero until end of turn, activate only as a sorcery. This ability triggers only once each turn. So I don't love this. You know, black red is the color pair that's the most about these outlaws, and this is a signpost uncommon, but I have some misgivings here. I'm not feeling great about the fact that it's an enchantment that doesn't always give you value up front. Um, it can make creature tokens when you do the right thing, but it doesn't do anything for you during your opponent's turn right away either. It's hard not to be skeptical of this kind of card these days as they just don't seem to pan out. If you have some outlaws in play already, you're gonna have better attacks on that turn, but I'm not sure that's enough for this to be a great signpost uncommon. Getting the tokens is obviously where you make your money here, and you're likely to get a few of those, but you need to get two before you really feel okay about this, and it will only do that very slowly. I don't think it's terrible. I mean, I think if you're in the black red deck, you're probably gonna play it, but it's also not the kind of card that pulls you into a color pair. It's the kind of card you play when you're in the color pair, and even then it's not gonna be anywhere close to like one of the best cards in your deck, I'm giving it a C. Next up, it's Badlands Revival, which for three generic, a black and a green is an uncommon sorcery. It says return up to one target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield, return up to one target permanent card from your graveyard to your hand. This is a nice version of this effect. One of the big bummers with five mana reanimation spells is that actually getting your mana's worth when you need to can be tough. But because this also gives you back a permanent, it's far more likely you'll feel okay about reanimating your 3-3 or whatever. Then it still has the big upside that any reanimation spell does where it might bring back something into play that is insane and your opponent just can't deal with it this early in the game. I still feel like this is situational enough that it isn't a super push signpost uncommon, giving it a C+. Next up, it's Baron Bertram Greywater, which for two generic, a white and a black, is a 3-4 legendary vampire noble at uncommon. Whenever one or more tokens enters the battlefield under your control, create a 1-1 black vampire rogue creature token with lifelink. This ability triggers only once each turn, and you can pay one generic and a black and sacrifice another creature or artifact to draw a card. So black-white is a token deck, but in particular, it likes sacrificing your tokens. There are plenty of ways to make tokens in this format, so getting these 1-1 one -one lifelinkers isn't gonna be a huge leap. Cashing tokens and other stuff in for cards is always a nice thing to have in the late game too. I do wish Bertram did something the turn he came down, but he's still pretty good, giving him a B minus. Next up, it's Bonnie Pal Clear Cutter, which for three generic green and two blue is a 6-5 legendary giant scout at rare. It's got reach. And when it enters the battlefield, you create Bow, a legendary blue ox creature token with. This creature's power and toughness are each equal to the number of lands you control. Whenever you attack, draw a card, then you may put a land card from your hand or graveyard onto the battlefield. <laughs> this is nuts. Six mana for a 6-5 and a 6-6 six, six is already an incredible deal, and that would already be a bomb. But then, this also draws you a card anytime you attack. The creature will get bigger and bigger the more lands you have in play. And it also, by the way, doesn't matter what is doing the attacking. So the turn you play, Bonnie, you can attack and immediately get to draw a card off of this trigger. So you can already be in position for a three for one the turn you play, Bonnie, and there's not really anything your opponent can do about it if it resolved. And then you get to untap with two huge creatures in play and the game is probably just over. I think this is just an A+. Next up, it's Breaches the Blast Maker, which for one generic, a blue and a red is a 3-3 legendary goblin pirate. At rare, it's got Menace. Whenever you cast your second spell each turn, you may sacrifice an artifact. If you do, flip a coin. When you win the flip, copy that spell. You may choose new targets for the copy. When you lose the flip, Breaches the Blast Maker deals damage equal to that spell's mana value to any target. Most of the time, when we have the words flip a coin on a card, they don't inspire much confidence, but this is pretty much a heads I win, tails you lose scenario, because whatever it is you get out of it, it's a card worth the value. Now, while there are artifacts in the scent, there aren't so many that you should always think you can have this lineup right. After all, you have to cast a second spell and have an artifact you want to give up, so this probably won't work out all the time. 
Casting a second spell is easier than normal in this set because of the plot mechanic. I do have that in mind, but still, the idea that you have to have both an artifact and a second spell line up to get this trigger to happen does keep this card from being, like, completely insane. He does have a really good baseline, and if you can just trigger this once, you're going to feel amazing. I'm giving this a B+. Next up, it's Bruce Tarl, Roving Rancher, which for two generica red and a white is a 4-3 legendary human warrior at rare. Oxen you control have double strike, and whenever it enters the battlefield or attacks, exile the top card of your library. If it's a land, create a 2-2 white ox creature token. Otherwise, you may cast it until the end of your next turn. So this is another creature who has an ox friend and another bomb. A 4-mana 4-3 that makes a 2-2 or draws you a card is easily a B+, as it sets you up for a 2-for-1, but you have the potential to get more triggers, and if Bruce sticks around, the ox tokens get a lot scarier, giving him an A-. Next up, it's Cactus Folk Sure Shot, which for 2 generic, a red, and a green, is a 4-4 plant mercenary at Uncommon. It's got reach and ward 2, and at the beginning of combat on your turn, other creatures you control with power 4 or greater gain trample and haste until end of turn. A 4-mana 4 4-4th four reach in Ward 2 is probably a C+, and granting Trample and Haste to your 4-power creatures is pretty sweet. Both of those keywords play well with those 4-power creatures too, since a lot of them have lower toughness and you want to turn them sideways anyway, and the Trample makes it hurt less if they get blocked by a bear or something. Do keep in mind it does not buff itself, unlike some versions of effects we see sometimes. Still, it looks like a powerful signpost in common to me, giving it a B. Next up, it's Congregation Griff, which for one generic, a green, and a white is a 1-4 Hippogriff mounted uncommon. It's got Flying and Lifelink, and whenever it attacks while saddled, it gets plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of mounts you control. So I mentioned mounts earlier. Here is the saddle mechanic. This particular card has saddle three, and that means tap any number of other creatures you control with total power three or more. This mount becomes saddled until end of turn, saddle only as a sorcery. So, it's a lot like crewing a vehicle, except you don't have to crew this for it to be a creature. It's always a creature, it just gets a bonus when you do saddle it, and in this case it gets plus X plus X until it of turn, where X is the number of mounts you control. It does count itself, so even if it's all alone, saddling this will allow it to attack as a 2-5 with Flying and Lifelink. So, a 3-mana 1-4 Flying and Lifelink is always going to make the cut, and, I mean, that's just a body that can really alter a race in your favor, especially if you can augment it, and this comes with a built-in way to do that. It's not always going to be super easy to saddle this, and sometimes it's not worth the downside of tapping a creature, but when you add lifelink to the mix, it does become a lot easier to say, well, it's fine that this isn't going to block. I'm going to create a life total difference between me and my opponent of at least four, and if you happen to have some other mounts around, which is what green and white's all about, it's going to get even bigger, and the life you gain and the damage it will do will create even more of a gap between your life and your opponent's. So it has a great baseline and a really awesome ceiling, giving it a B. Next up, it's Doc Arlock, Grizzled Genius, which for a green and a blue is a 2-3 legendary creature Bear Druid at Uncommon. Spells you cast from your graveyard or from exile cost 2 generic less to cast, and plotting cards from your hand cost 2 generic less. Plot's a mechanic in the set that lets you pay a cost for a card on one turn, and then on a later turn you can cast it for free. So, discounting your plots is a pretty big deal in this format, as it will make it much more worthwhile to wait a turn to cast things when they cost 2 less. If you do that with Doc in play, you're still getting the card into play ahead of schedule in most cases, even if you had to wait a turn. The bad news is, he doesn't really do anything else on his own, apart from having solid stats. The graveyard side of things will come up occasionally, but I'm giving this a C+. Next up, it's Ariette the Beguiler, which for one generic, a white, a blue, and a black, is a 4-4 legendary human warlock at rare. It's got lifelink. Whenever an aura you control becomes attached to a non-land permanent opponent controls with mana value less than or equal to that aura's mana value, gain control of that permanent for as long as that aura is attached to it. The ceiling on Ariette is kind of insane. All of your auras become potential mind controls, and even if Ariette goes down, they don't get the creature back. Only problem is... This set doesn't feature a heavy aura theme, so actually pulling that off isn't super likely. I think she probably needs a build around grade because if you can get her going, she's completely insane, but when you can't, she's a hard to cast 4 mana 4-4 four, four with lifelink, which is probably just a C because of the challenges of the mana value, maybe a C plus at best. In other words, she's not really worth splashing for unless you end up with like three auras that are decent, at which point I think she kind of skyrockets up to a B+. You really only need to pull this off once for her to be worth it. 
Next up, it's Eartha Joe Frontier Mentor, which for two generic, a red and a white, is a 2-4 legendary core advisor at Uncommon. When she enters, you get one of those mercenary tokens. And whenever you activate an ability that targets a creature or player, copy that ability. You may choose new targets for the copy. Four mana for a 2-4 and a 1-1 is a decent enough deal, and this comes with big additional upside. Obviously, the token it makes has an activated ability that will get copied, and there are lots of these tokens in the set. Being able to have a few of them in play and copying those is good. Then there are all kinds of other activated abilities that you can also copy with her, and in addition to that, she has that really reasonable baseline. I think she's a B-. Next up, it's Form a Posse, which for X, a red, and a white is an uncommon sorcery. You create X, one, one, red mercenary creature tokens. So this is slow and not particularly good early, but by the mid to late game, it allowed enough to the board to be worthwhile, especially if you've got some nice payoffs for going wide, giving it a C plus. Next up, it's Gear Red, Mirror of the Wild, which for a red, a green, and a white is a 3-3 legendary human shaman at Mythic Rare. It's got haste. And non-token creatures you control, including himself, have tap, create a token that's a copy of target token you control that entered the battlefield this turn. There are enough tokens in this set for Gear Ed to do some work. I mean, every one of your creatures can make a copy of a token you make, and that's pretty insane, even if they are just mercenary tokens or whatever. I don't think you need to go very hard on building around Gear Ed because it's in three colors with plenty of tokens. The mana is really the only hurdle, and it's not that big of one, giving it a B. Next up, it's the Gitrog, Ravenous Ride, which for three generic, a black and a green is a 6-5 legendary frog horror mount. That's right, he's a mount now. It's got Trample and Haste, and when it deals combat damage to a player, you can sacrifice a creature that saddled it this turn. If you do, draw X cards, and then put up to X land cards from your hand onto the battlefield tapped, where X is a sacrifice creature's power, saddle one. I'm already sold on a 5-mana 6-5 with Trample and Haste. That is an absolute beating. So the fact you can also give up a creature that saddles it to potentially draw a bunch of cards is pretty nuts. Even if you never saddle it, you've got a creature that represents a fast clock, and Haste and Trample means it's very hard for your opponent not to take some significant damage the turn you play him, and probably on the next turn too, even if they can take him down by then. Then you mix in this saddle upside, which can really be completely insane, and you've definitely got a bomb, giving it an A. Next up, it's Honest Rootstein, which for one generic, a black and a green, is a 3-2 legendary human warlock at Uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. Creature spells you cast cost one less to cast. I'd play a 3-mana three 3-2 three that reduced the cost of my creature spells, and I'd play a 3-mana three 3-2 three that returns a creature to my hand, so it's a good thing that Honest Rootstein does both. Sometimes you won't have something to get back on turn three, and that can be a bummer with this kind of card, but because he's reasonably efficient and has another ability, running him out in those situations when you have to isn't a disaster. Though obviously you want to get the two for one more often than not. And in the late game with the cost reduction, being able to get something back with Honest Rootstein and then play it right away is far more likely. This looks like a strong signpost to me, giving it a B. Next up, it's Intimidation Campaign, which for one generic, a blue and a black, is an uncommon enchantment. When it enters a battlefield, each opponent loses one life, and you gain one life, and you draw a card. Whenever you commit a crime, you may return Intimidation Campaign to its owner's hand. This reminds me of Disinformation Campaign, which was a really fun card in Guilds of Ravnica. It's probably not quite as good. Disinformation Campaign made your opponent discard instead of the life drain effect, but this does seem like it has some serious potential to be a value engine. Having to cast it over and over again is a little clunky, but the life drain helps offset the fact that you probably aren't adding to the board. I would really love for this card to be incredible in this format, but given how fast formats have been lately, I think I need to temper my expectations. It has potential, but not adding to the board is enough of a problem. I'm going to start this at a C+. Next up, it's Gem Lightfoot Sky Explorer, which for two generic, a white and a blue, is a 3-3 legendary human scouted uncommon. She's got flying and vigilance, and at the beginning of your instep, if you haven't cast a spell from your hand this turn, draw a card. A 4-mana 3-3 with flying and vigilance is probably only like a C these days, believe it or not. So it's not amazing, but it's not a bad starting point, especially because drawing cards with Gem is pretty doable. Blue-white has plenty of cards with plot, and those work really well with this because when you plot a card, you're not casting it, right? So you get to draw a card that turn. Then on your next turn, if all you do is play the card that you plotted, you aren't casting it from your hand. So you get to draw a card, assuming you don't do anything else. Then you mix in the fact that blue-white has a whole bunch of flash stuff going on, and you end up with a card that can definitely draw you cards. It's going to stink when your opponent can use like a two mana removal spell to kill her, but if she sticks around, she's going to give you some serious value, I'm giving her a B minus. 
Next up, it's Jolene, Plundering Pugilist, which for one generic, a red and a green, is a 4-2 legendary human mercenary at Uncommon. Whenever you attack with one or more creatures with power 4 or greater, including itself, create a treasure token. And you can pay one generic and a red and sacrifice a treasure, and Jolene does one damage to any target. So, treasure will help you play more big creatures, or you can cast a treasure into pink stuff. And I like that second part, because treasure has diminishing returns the longer a game goes on. And if you have, like, a bunch of mana lying around, and turning all those treasure into one damage can really make a difference. Still, her stat line is medium, and it's not like treasure is completely broken either. It's just not that strong of a payoff. I'm giving her a C+. Next up, it's Kambal, Profiteering Mare, which for one generic, a white and a black, is a 2-4 legendary human advisor at rare. Whenever one or more tokens enter the battlefield under your opponent's control, for each of them, create a tap token that's a copy of it. This ability triggers only once each turn. Whenever one or more tokens enter the battlefield under your control, each opponent loses one life, and you gain one life. So this is a pretty good token payoff. Black-White likes to make tokens, so you're going to be able to trigger that second part a lot, and your opponents are likely to make tokens too. Obviously, you don't have nearly as much control over that, but Kambal with just the Drain Life effect would be a really good card for black-white decks, and sometimes you're just going to get free tokens because your opponents are making tokens. Keep in mind this counts treasure, too. It's not just mercenary tokens. This looks pretty good to me overall, giving him a B. Next up, it's Kellen joins up, which for a green, a white, and a blue is a rare legendary enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, you may exile a non-land card with mana value three or less from your hand. If you do, it becomes plotted. Whenever a legendary creature enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus and plus one counter on each creature you control. So the end of the battlefield trigger here isn't great, generally speaking. You end up plotting something that costs three anyway, so you're not going to be able to get a discount. Though it does mean you can plot things you normally couldn't. That said, with this joins up enchantment, for it to really be worthwhile, because otherwise it's not really doing anything, you really need to get the legendary trigger going. The good news is the thing it asks you to do with your legendary creatures is pretty easy. You know, you just have to resolve one, basically. And then the payoff you get is pretty big, because you get a counter on everything. The bad news is there are, of course, not any legendary creatures at common, for example. You can only get them at uncommon or higher, and there aren't that many that are uncommon. Some of the signposts are legendary creatures, as we've seen, but you can't count on triggering this, like, all the time. This isn't a set that has, like, this massive legendary theme that you can really, really feel like you're going to trigger this all the time. And that's a problem, because the baseline of this card just isn't very good. Still, I think if you have like three legendary creatures, you're probably playing this because the payoff for getting that going is pretty big. And I think having three legendary creatures is kind of a reasonable ex expectation. I'm giving it a C plus. Next up, we have Kellen the Kid, which for a green, a white, and a blue is a 3-3 legendary human fairy rogue at Mythic Rare. He's got flying and lifelink. Whenever you cast a spell from anywhere other than your hand, you may cast a permanent spell with equal or lesser mana value from your hand without paying its mana cost. If you don't, you may put a land card from your hand onto the battlefield. So this triggered ability really doesn't work out in Limited very often. In the early game, you might be able to cast something for free or put a land in play when you cast something you plotted, but you quickly end up in spots where you're not able to take advantage of discount effects like this. A 3-mana three 3-3 three, three with Flying and Lifelink is pretty amazing, though. And if you have good enough mana to get him into play, he's going to be pretty insane. And then occasionally just allow you to also put something into play for free, giving him a B. Next up, it's Krom, Violent Cacophony, which for two generic, a blue and a red, is a 2-3 zombie horror at Uncommon. It's got Flying. Whenever you cast your second spell each turn, put a plus and plus one counter on Krom and draw a card. So the downside here is it starts out sort of efficient because this trigger is amazing. Plot will let you get that card in counter the turn you cast it pretty often, though. You can plot on one turn, next turn play Krom, then play the thing you plotted. So he's a 3-4 that's drawn you a card before your opponent ever gets to untap. And that doesn't seem like a crazy corner case play pattern. That seems like what blue-red decks are going to do because they're about casting cheap spells and they're about plotting spells. So getting this trigger once before your opponent has a chance to kill him Seems reasonable enough, and if you can do that, it's going to be pretty good. And obviously, if it sticks around and you keep doing stuff like that, the value is going to get even crazier. I'm giving this a B. Next up, it's Laughing Jasper Flint, which for one generic, a black and a red, is a 4-3 legendary lizard rogue at rare. Creatures you control but don't own are mercenaries in addition to their other types. At the beginning of your upkeep, exile the top X cards of target opponent's library, where X is the number of outlaws you control. Until end of turn, you may cast spells from among those cards, and mana of any type can be spent to cast those spells. 
So the first line of text isn't going to come up that much. You have to steal your opponent's stuff for them to be mercenaries. There is an uncommon red card, you know, threat and effect where sometimes maybe it ends up mattering, but not really because the outlaw creature type really only matters on your upkeep and you're not going to control a creature of your opponents on your upkeep in black red. It's just not going to happen. But that doesn't really matter because Laughing Jasper Flint is a three mana four three that basically draws you a card every turn. Um, you know, that's the minimum because he's a rogue, so he is an outlaw. And if you have more outlaws than that, you have the potential to just cast a ton of cards. So you do need to get to untap, but Jasper Flint is so cheap. You can get him into play so early and then quickly get card advantage before your opponent can ever do anything about it that he looks like a bomb to me, giving him an A. Next up, it's Lazav, Familiar Stranger, which for one generic, a blue and a black, is a 1-4 legendary shapeshifter at Uncommon. Whenever you commit a crime, you put a plus and plus one counter on Lazav, then you may exile a card from a graveyard. If a creature card was exiled this way, you may have Lazav become a copy of that creature until end of turn. This ability triggers only once each turn. Lazav is going to grow, and starting out as a 1-4 is pretty nice for a creature that will gain counters, because a lot of them are small enough that your opponent can kill them really cheaply, before you ever really get a chance to grow them. Four toughness is high enough that it's gonna be hard for your opponent to consistently do that. And he's gonna to get to be a two five before too long and then potentially copy something on some terms and be even bigger. This just seems like it will generate a ton of value. He won't be that hard to grow in a color pair that's all about committing crimes, giving him a B. Next up, it's Lila, undefeated Slick Shot, which for one generic, a blue and a red is a three three legendary human rogue at rare with prowess. Whenever you cast a multicolored instant or sorcery spell from your hand, exile that spell instead of putting it into your graveyard as it resolves. If you do, it becomes plotted. A 3-mana three 3-3 three, three with prowess is an attractive card already, and she effectively doubles your multicolored instants and sorceries. In so doing, she also gets two prowess triggers out of those cards. This format doesn't have a huge number of multicolored instants and sorceries, so it won't come up a ton. But when it does, it will feel like you're breaking the game, and the baseline of the card is already good. I'm giving this a B. If this format had more multicolored instants or sorceries, she'd probably get closer to bomb range. Next up, it's Make Your Own Luck, which for three generic, a green and a blue is an uncommon sorcery. Look at the top three cards of your library. You may exile a non-land card from among them. If you do, it becomes plotted. Put the rest into your hand. So this is a five mana draw three at sorcery speed. Those don't tend to be great in limited most of the time, just because, you know, they don't add to the board. They're slow, they're clunky. If you get to untap after drawing all those cards, it can feel okay, but sometimes you've lost so much tempo that you're in trouble. But this does something interesting that I think gives it some potential. That being that it effectively makes one of the spells free, even though you don't get to cast it that turn, but because you spent five mana to draw three, you're probably not casting anything else on your turn anyway. So you have this option to plot something and it could potentially be really expensive. You could get to play it at a discount, but even if you don't, even if you just get like a three drop out of it, your next turn is gonna be big enough that it can probably pull you back ahead from behind. There are gonna be times where you hit like two lands and one spell with this, and those aren't exactly gonna feel very exciting. You could even hit three lands with this, which is gonna be completely miserable. You really need to be plotting something decent with this for it to work out. And I think you can do it often enough that this is an okay signpost uncommon, but I'm always gonna be skeptical in this day and age when we have a card that's a sorcery that doesn't add to the board inherently or subtract from it for that matter. And this, this is that. So I'm gonna start it at a C plus. Next up, it's Malcolm, the Eyes, which for a blue and a red is a 2-2 legendary siren pirate at rare with flying in haste. Whenever you cast your second spell each turn, investigate. A two mana 2-2 with flying in haste, even when it's this hard to cast on turn two consistently is probably a B minus. So generating clues with this is awesome. Keep in mind, if you play Malcolm later and then cast a second spell that same turn, you get a clue right away. You can, of course, also pull this off with plot and things like that. I'm giving this a B. Next up, it's Marchesa, Dealer of Death, which for a blue, a black, and a red is a 3-4 legendary human rogue at rare. Whenever you commit a crime, you can pay one generic. If you do, look at the top two cards of your library, put one of them into your hand and the other into your graveyard. This is a pretty great crime payoff. Having to have the one generic to get it to trigger will be a bummer sometimes since you often have to spend mana to commit a crime, but still it isn't a huge ask, and she also doesn't limit it to once per turn, unlike most versions of this effect, which is pretty sweet. Three colors does mean you need to make sure your mana's good, but other than that, she looks like she's just gonna line up really well in all of the different Grixis decks in the format, so I don't think she really needs a build around grade or anything. I think she's just a B plus. 
Next up, it's Miriam, Herd Whisperer, which for a green and a white is a 3-2 legendary human druid at Uncommon. As long as it's your turn, mounts and vehicles you control have hexproof. Whenever a mount or vehicle you control attacks, put a plus and plus one counter on it. These are nice base stats, and giving mounts and vehicles hexproof during your turn is pretty nice, because crewing or saddling one of them and then it getting destroyed is an absolute tempo killer. And then, obviously, buffing them when they attack is awesome. I'm giving this a B. Keep in mind, the mounts don't have to be saddled to get the boost. Obviously, vehicles do because they can't attack unless they're crewed. But you can buff your mounts uh, easily here without even having to saddle them, which is nice. I'm giving her a B. Next up, it's Obeka, Splitter of Seconds, which for one generic, a blue, a black, and a red is a 2-5 legendary ogre warlock at rare. She's got Menace, and when she deals combat damage to a player... You get that many additional upkeep steps after this phase. This is a cool design, and it looks awesome for Commander. For Limited, not so much. A 4-mana 2-5 with Menace is solid, but not when it's three colors. You're unlikely to get any real advantage out of additional upkeeps consistently, so trying to play this thing is likely to just hurt your mana base for a card that generally isn't powerful enough. I think she's a D. Next up, it's Oko, the Ringleader, which for two generic, a green and a blue, is a mythic rare legendary planeswalker Oko. It starts at three loyalty. At the beginning of combat on your turn, Oko becomes a copy of up to one target creature you control until end of turn, except he has hexproof. He's got a plus one that draws you two cards. If you've committed a crime this turn, you discard a card, otherwise you discard two. He's got a minus one that makes a 3-3 elk, of course, but just a token. You don't get to turn any permanent, basically, into a 3-3 elk. And he's got a minus five that says for each other an online permanent you control, create a token that's a copy of that permanent. So Oko's a bomb again. His abilities are all great. His ability to become a hexproof creature means that he can help you pressure your opponent in a way most planeswalkers just can't. His plus one is faithless looting at worst, and that's a powerful effect, and sometimes it'll be better. His minus one can make a body to protect him if you're behind, and his minus five is likely to win you the game in many situations. I don't really know what else to say here. Oko's great on virtually any board state. He's going to generate real value even if he dies right away. And if he sticks around for more than a turn, the game's probably over, giving him an A+. Next up, it's Pillage the Bog, which for a black and a green is a rare sorcery. Look at the top X cards of your library, where X is twice the number of lands you control. Put one of them into your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. And it has plot for one generic, a black and a green. So this is just a card selection spell, no matter how you cast it. It can be awesome card selection in the late game, almost a tutor even, but in the early game, it's just like anticipate. And it isn't like either of those cards are actually that good and limited. You know, if this was always a two mana tutor, that would be one thing, but it takes enough setup that, you know, it isn't anything that special. It's just gonna give you a one for one anytime you cast it. It's just a C. Next up, it's Rakdos joins up, which for three generic, a black, and a red is a rare legendary enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield with two additional plus and plus one counters on it. Whenever a legendary creature you control dies, Rakdos joins up deals damage equal to that creature's power to target opponent. Reanimating something for five is often mediocre, but because you get two counters, it will feel less terrible no matter what you reanimate. The legendary trigger here isn't super amazing, so this is mostly just an okay reanimation spell. Reanimating a legendary creature with this can potentially be pretty spicy, but I wouldn't count on doing that consistently. I'm giving this a C. Next up, it's Rakdos the Muscle, which for two generic, two black, and a red is a 6-5 legendary demon mercenary at Mythic Rare with Flying and Trample. Whenever you sacrifice another creature, exile cards equal to its mana value from the top of target player's library. Until your next instep, you may play those cards, and mana of any type can be spent to cast those spells. And you can sack another creature, and Rakdos gains indestructible until end of turn. Tap it. Activate only once each turn. Look, another Rakdos who is a complete and utter bomb. He's huge, and he has flying, and he's hard to kill because of his activated ability. I'd probably have him as a bomb if things stopped there, but they don't. He also lets you exile a ton of cards from the top of your opponent's library when you sacrifice things, which he can help you do. Rakdos seems near unbeatable and limited. He can only use that ability once a turn, so two removal spells can do it, but you're still coming out way ahead when that happens, and if your opponent can't kill him, the game is just over. Do keep in mind, sometimes people mix this up. When a card has tap it as part of the effect, they think it's part of the cost, so if you're thinking Rakdos can only become indestructible if he's untapped, you're wrong. Don't point a removal spell at him or anything like that. Your opponent can still use the ability even if he's already tapped. Anyway, big bomb, giving him an A+. 
Next up, it's Riku of Mini Paths, which for a green, a blue, and a red is a 3-3 legendary human wizard at rare. Whenever you cast a modal spell, choose up to X, where X is the number of times you chose a mode for that spell. You can exile the top card of your library until the end of your next turn. You can play it. You can put a counter on Riku, and it gains trample until end of turn, or you can make a 1-1 bluebird creature token with flying. So the main thing this is meant to interact with is the spree mechanic, which we aren't going to see in this video. There aren't multicolored cards with Spree. I'll put one on the screen, obviously. This is a modal mechanic that shows up all over the set, including at Common. So I don't think making it work with Riku is that hard. There are also other modal cards in the set, too. That's just the big theme that Riku works with. And casting even one Spree with Riku in play is pretty nuts, even with just one mode chosen, as tacking on any of these effects to a card that's already decent is awesome. You go for the cards or grow Rika sometimes, but you're probably going to be after that 1-1 one, one flyer the most often. Now, this isn't exactly a three-color format, as I've said with these other three-color legends, but there's a common cycle of duels. This is green. There's enough fixing for you to pull this off. You don't have to get it into play on turn three for it to be good either, and I think actually managing to trigger these is easy. If you can get more than one trigger in a turn, these get especially crazy, and the spree cards really let you do it. I think this is a B plus. I don't think it needs a build-around grade. I think you're going to end up with like three or four spree cards relatively easily, and they're going to be nuts when you have Riku in play. Next up, it's Roxanne, Starfall Savant, which for three generic, a red and a green is a 4-3 legendary cat druid at rare. When it enters a battlefield or attacks, you create a tapped colorless artifact token named Meteorite with, when Meteorite enters the battlefield, it deals two damage to any target and tap at one mana of any color. Whenever you tap an artifact token for mana, add one mana of any type that artifact token produced. She looks great. Getting meteorites is no small thing, and they are worthwhile all game long because they shock stuff. The fact she doubles and fixes your mana will come up on occasion, but you're going to be able to get two meteorites out of her pretty often, and then your opponent has to trade with her when she attacks. At that point, we're probably talking about a three for one. She gives you value right away, no matter what, too. So I think she sneaks into the lower bomb range. I'm giving her an A-. minus. Next up, it's Ruthless Lawbringer, which for one generic, a white and a black, is a 3-2 vampire assassin at Uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, you can sack another creature, and when you do, you destroy target non-land permanent. This is a quality sign post Uncommon. We've already seen in this video that black-white has plenty of fodder to sacrifice for value, and this is going to feel pretty great when it comes down and destroys something when you sacrifice something very minor, giving it a B-. Next up, it's Satoru the Infiltrator, which for a blue and a black is a 2-3 legendary human ninja rogue at rare. He's got Menace, and whenever Satoru and or one or more other non-token creatures enter the battlefield under your control, if none of them were cast or no mana was spent to cast them, draw a card. That is some really bad templating, but basically what he says is, for this format, basically if you cast a thing after you plot it, you get to draw a card from it. Also works if you reanimate something, for example, those are the big ways where it's actually going to matter in this format. It doesn't seem like a huge leap to think you can play Satoru and play a card you plotted the previous turn, at which point you're up a card, which is pretty nice, especially because the baseline here is a 2-mana two 2-3 two, with Menace, giving him a B. Next up, it's Selvala Eager Trailblazer, which for two generic, a green and a white, is a 4-5 legendary elf scout at Mythic Rare. She's got Vigilance, and whenever you cast a creature spell, you create a 1-1 one, one red mercenary creature token. You can also tap her and choose a color and add one mana of that color for each different power among creatures you control. She's got great starting stats, and she's going to crank out a ton of tokens. I mean, creature spells are just the most common kind of spell in your deck. Her ability to ramp mana won't always be useful, but when it is, it's going to feel nice. And because of Vigilance, you can swing with it and still leave mana up. This is a bomb, giving her an A. Next up, it's Seraphic Steed, which for a green and a white is a 2-2 unicorn mounted uncommon. It's got First Strike and Lifelink. And when it attacks while saddled, you create a 3-3 white angel creature token with flying, and it has saddle 4. A 2-mana 2-2 two -two with First Strike and Lifelink is a great creature pretty much all game long. While saddling this isn't the easiest thing ever, getting a 3-3 flyer for doing it is well worth it. I'm giving this a B+. Next up, it's Slick Sequence, which for a blue and a red is an uncommon instant. It deals two damage to any target. If you've cast another spell this turn, draw a card. Two mana to do two to any target is like a C-level card, when it's an instant at least. And drawing a card with this isn't that hard. It's very doable thanks to plots in the format, but if you just have other cheap spells in your deck, it's easy to pull off too. It is one of the few cards in the set that you can give plot to with Lila, which is pretty exciting, giving it a B-. Next up, it's Ty Waikin, Perfect Shot, which for a red and a white is a 2-3 legendary creature, human mercenary at rare. Whenever a source you control deals non-combat damage to a creature equal to that creature's toughness, draw a card, and you can pay X and tap it, 
And if a source you control would deal non-combat damage to a permanent or player this turn, it deals that much damage plus X instead. So this is one of these cards that really likes non-combat damage, and as usual, cards that do stuff with that aren't that easy to like really go off with in Limited, but they also aren't that hard to get like one trigger out of in Limited either, because lots of removal, especially in red and white, does damage. So you're gonna draw cards with this sometimes, it's going to augment your damage-based removal spells sometimes, probably like 80% of the time, it's also just gonna be a two mana two three. I think the total package here is like a B minus. Next up, it's Vile Smasher, Gleeful Grenadier, which for a black and a green is a 3-2 legendary goblin mercenary at Uncommon. Whenever another outlaw enters the battlefield under your control, Vile Smasher deals one damage to target opponent. This is a two drop that can do a ton of damage over the course of the game. Like if you play this on two and just curve out and make multiple mercenary tokens and stuff, your opponent's life total is gonna go down in a hurry. Still, it's also not completely insane or anything. It doesn't feel like the payoffs that's really gonna pull you into the deck, although if this format ends up being insanely aggressive, I could see Vile Smasher being even better than I think, but I'm starting him at C+. Next up, it's Vraska Joins Up, which for a black and a green is a rare legendary enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, you put a death touch counter on each creature you control, and whenever a legendary creature you control deals combat damage to a player, you draw a card. This doesn't seem great. Your whole board getting death touch is cool and all, but because it uses counters, you need them to already be out there. Furthermore, the effect isn't that great to begin with, so you're going to need to draw some cards, and that's kind of a big ask. You need a legendary creature, and you needed to get it through for damage. If you had the legendary creature in play already, and now it has death touch, maybe that makes a difference, but if your opponent could already block and kill the thing, they probably still can. I guess it makes double blocks and stuff like that worse, but death touch just doesn't change things in the equation enough for me on most board states for this to be worth playing on its own. It's pretty terrible on turn two, for example. I, I think it's just a D. Next up, it's Vraska the Silencer, which for one generic, a black and a green is a 3-3 legendary Gorgon Assassin at Mythic Rare. She's got Death Touch, and whenever a non-token creature an opponent controls dies, you can pay one generic. If you do return that card to the battlefield tapped under your control, it's a treasure with tap, sacrifice this artifact, add one man of any color, and it loses all other card types. So, the creature it brings back is no longer a creature. It's just a treasure. But if it has activated or static abilities, you do gain access to those. So keep that in mind. It's treasure with upside. A three mana three three death touch is a nice starting point too, giving her a B. Next up, it's Wrangler of the Damned, which for three generic, a white and a blue is a one four human soldier at uncommon. It's got flash. And at the beginning of your instep, if you haven't cast a spell from your hand this turn, create a two two white spirit creature token with flying. We've already seen that blue-white is about doing things at instant speed and using the plot mechanic to get these sorts of triggers. And this is a strong trigger. I mean, a 2-2 flyer is a very, very real body that your opponent has to account for. And because this has flash itself, it can help you trigger your other things because you're not gonna cast anything on your turn. Then you'll flash this in at the end of your opponent's turn. And that also means it's more likely to stick around long enough to make you that 2-2 flyer. Obviously it works well with plot in addition to working well with flash. One of the nice things about this and the other signpost we saw for blue-white is that when you're in top deck mode in the late game and you're like sort of desperate to draw a spell, if you have one of these in play, you have a pretty reasonable fail case because you get a trigger. So there's sort of a flood insurance of sorts in the later stages of the game, in addition to just doing synergistic stuff in general. The thing I don't like here is that a five mana one four is pretty miserable. Like that is way, way off from the stats that you really wanna be getting for five mana but I think the flash and the upside that I think is reasonably accessible is enough for this to be a B minus. And our last multicolored card is Wily Duke, Ateen Hero, which for one generic, a green and a white is a 4-2 legendary creature, human ranger at rare with vigilance. When it becomes tapped, you gain one life and draw a card. This would actually probably be better if it didn't have vigilance because then just attacking with it would trigger that great ability. As it is, you have to rely on crewing vehicles or saddling creatures to make it happen. The good news is that's what green white's about in this format. And the vigilance can kind of be upside, like you can attack with this and then choose to crew a vehicle or saddle it. I mean, there's not a lot of reason to do that because you can only saddle at sorcery speed, for example, but you could just get the trigger by doing it. And sometimes that's obviously gonna be worth doing because that's a pretty real trigger. Still, you know, two toughness, three mana, that's a little bit of a liability, but I think Wily Duke will be able to draw you enough cards to be pretty good, giving it a B. All right, let's move into artifacts now, the colorless ones anyway. We've got Bandits Hall first, which for three generic is an uncommon artifact. When you commit a crime, you put a loot counter on it, triggers only once each turn. You can tap it for one mana of any color, and you can pay two and tap it to remove two loot counters from Bandits Hall, draw a card. 
This is a three mana card that doesn't really add to the board, and that's a problem. It fixes and ramps your mana, and you can draw a card with it eventually. But the name of the game in Limited for the last year or so has been adding to the board, and cards like this have been a liability. I think it's a D. Next up, it's Boombox, which for two generic is an uncommon artifact. You can pay six and tap it and sack it to destroy up to one target artifact, up to one target creature, and up to one target land. This is tempting. It can destroy three permanents, after all. That's a three for one. But the problem is how much it costs and how often it will actually matter that it can take down something that isn't a creature. Overall, I think it's too inefficient to be a card you want to play most of the time. It's the kind of card you run when you're desperate for removal. Maybe it's a little better to side in against someone who's heavy into artifacts, but there's not an artifact deck in this format. So I see this as just being sort of a card you play out of desperation, giving it a D. Next up, it's Gold Pan, which for two generic is a common artifact equipment. When it enters the battlefield, you create a treasure. Quick creature gets plus one, plus one, and you can equip for one generic. This looks kind of all right. I mean, it makes a treasure, so you can potentially equip it the turn you play it. And if you need that treasure for other purposes, you can hold on to it. The boost isn't amazing, like, initially, but being able to move plus and plus one around for one mana is reasonable. I mean, you have one mana left over a lot in the mid to late stages of the game, and being able to move this around, it matters. It's nothing special, but I think it'll make the cut often enough to be a C-. minus. Next up, it's Lava Spur Boots, which for one generic mana is an uncommon artifact equipment. Equip creature gets plus and plus zero and has haste and ward one, and you can equip it for one. We've seen a lot of equipment that gives haste cheap in the past, and plus and plus zero as well. Adding ward to the mix doesn't really move the needle for me. I mean, you, you see this and you get kind of excited, and you're like, well, it's basically like all of my creatures have kicker, get plus and plus zero, and haste. And when you say that, it sounds pretty good but it's not as good as you think. First of all, you don't have the extra mana lying around often enough for it to be awesome. Additionally, it turns out that effect just doesn't feel like it's worth a card in many, many situations. So I think this is just a D. Next up, it's Luxurious Locomotive, which for five generic is an artifact vehicle at Uncommon. When it attacks, you create a treasure for each creature that crewed it this turn, and you can crew one, activate only once each turn. Crew 1 is easy to do. That's like the sweet spot. Anytime I see Crew 1 on a vehicle, I start thinking, this one's definitely playable. This format has a bunch of tokens in it. It'll be easy to make this happen. The bummer is a 5-mana 6-5 that makes you jump through a hoop to allow it to attack that only has the upside of giving you treasure. That's not that exciting. I mean, I think this card is solid, don't get me wrong, but it's not like an insane vehicle or anything either. I think it's just a C. Next up, it's Mobile Homestead, which for two generic is a 3-3 artifact vehicle at Uncommon. It has haste as long as you control amounts, and when it attacks, you look at the top card of your library. If it's a land card, you can put it on the battlefield tap, and it does Crew 2. A 2-mana two 3-3 vehicle with Crew 2 isn't very good, but the fact that this can get you lands, and even ramp you, actually, makes me a little more interested in it, and it'll have haste, especially in green-white, giving it a C. Next up, it's Oasis Gardener, which for three generic is a 2-2 artifact creature Scarecrow at common. When it enters, you gain two life, and it can tap for one mana of any color. Three mana 2-2 is a rough stat line these days, since your opponent can usually spend, like, one mana to kill it, and the tempo hit is real, but this gaining you life helps offset how much that hurts. And you get the upside of a nice little mana dork that can fix your mana and ramp it, of course, giving it a C. Next up, it's Red Rock Sentinel, which for three generic is a 2-4 artifact creature golem at Uncommon. It's got Defender, and you can pay two generic and tap it and sack a land to draw a card and create a treasure token. A three mana 2-4 Defender isn't very good, but this does have an ability that is nice in the late game. It's pretty awkward to use in the early game, but a three mana 2-4 body isn't a disaster. I'm giving this a C-. Next up, it's Silver Deputy, which for two generic is a 1-2 artifact creature mercenary at Common. When it enters the battlefield, you can search your library for a basic land card or a desert card, reveal it, then shuffle and put it on top. And it has the ability all the mercenary tokens do. You can tap it to give plus and plus zero to a creature you control, activate only as a sorcery. So this is a useful creature type, and it can fix your mana, although anytime we have a card that puts the card on top of your library, it's way worse. But this can grab dual lands, because there are desert dual lands in this set, as we'll see in a little bit. And that definitely matters. The stat line's not great, but I think this does enough little things to certainly be fine, giving it a C. Next up, it's Sterling Hound, which for three generic is a 3-2 artifact creature dog at common. When it enters the battlefield, you can surveil two. They always give us like a three mana, 3-2 three, artifact creature that does like a little thing when it enters the battlefield. And they're always cards you run if you're really desperate to fill out your curve or you need more creatures. But the fact that this format doesn't really have an artifact deck kind of hurts it. And the fact that there's only one real graveyard deck, which is black green, also hurts it. So none of the like little synergy points that might bump this up to being a card you actually feel okay about playing. They're not there. So you just get an inefficient creature with 
Really underwhelming ETB ability. I think it's just a D plus. Next up, it's Tomb Trawler, which for two generic is a 0-4 artifact creature golem at uncommon. You can pay two generic to put target card from your graveyard on the bottom of your library. Yeah, this isn't worth it. <laughs> the idea here is that you can use it to keep yourself from milling out, like if you're a self-mill deck like Black Green. And if you get to that point, it basically lets you choose what you draw every turn. But this kind of thing has panned out like once in the last 10 years in Shadows over Innistrad, you could actually do this. But it hasn't panned out any other time I thought it might. So what you're getting here is a two mana zero four that is almost entirely irrelevant. It's an F. Let's move to lands now. We've got a cycle of desert dual lands, as I already alluded to. Like all of them are like abraded bluffs and every color pair has one. They're all common, they're all deserts, they enter tapped and they do one damage to the opponent when they enter. And you could tap them to add one of two colors. In the case of abraded bluffs, you get red or white. I really like this common cycle of duels. Entering tapped is a problem, but chipping in for damage and having a useful subtype helps make up for that. And they're just great fixing to begin with. Like most common dual land cycles, I think these are a C plus. There's also cards that pay you off for having deserts, so keep that in mind. Next up, we have Arid Archway, which is an uncommon land desert. It enters tapped. When it enters a battlefield, you return a land you control to its owner's hand. If another desert was returned this way, surveil one, and it can tap to add two colorless. It's been a while since we've had a bounce land. Primeval Titan decks are probably excited about this. These are better than they look because in a way they give you card advantage. They're one land that produces two mana. So even though you have to bounce a land back to your hand, they really are more powerful than they look. The fact that it only produces colorless hurts, like when we saw the original, well, not the original, but the second cycle of bounce lands that we saw came in original Ravnica and they were all dual lands. And so they gave you great fixing too. This doesn't do that, right? Because it only produces colorless. So it's not gonna be as good as those lands were, but I think it'll be better than people expect. I'm giving it a C. Next up, it's Conduit Pylons, which is a common land desert. When it enters a battlefield, you surveil one. You can tap it for colorless, or you can pay one generic and tap it for one mana of any color. Filter lands have been pretty solid lately, especially when they have other stuff going on, and this does. The surveil is nice. It has a useful subtype. I'm giving it a C. Next up, it's Mirage Mesa, which is a common land desert. When it enters a battlefield, it does so tapped, and you choose a color, and you can have one mana of the chosen color. We see a card like this all the time. This one has a useful subtype. It's gonna be nice fixing and gonna power up a few of your cards, giving it a C plus. Next up, it's Sandstorm Verge, which is an uncommon land desert. You can tap it for colorless and you can pay three generic to make it so target creature can't block this turn, activate only as a sorcery. I think most of the deserts in the set are gonna be cards you end up playing a decent chunk of the time, but not this one. Um, it doesn't fix your mana for one thing and it doesn't give you that good of utility. Uh, making one creature unable to block is kind of nice. It can really change things on some turns, but it's way better to make one of your creatures unblockable because it doesn't matter what your opponent has. So you end up hurting your mana base for this particular desert and the upside it gives you just isn't enough for me. I think it's a D plus. Then there is a cycle of fast lands for the enemy colors. You know, we've seen these before. They're all like concealed courtyard. They enter tapped unless you control two or fewer other lands and you can tap them for two colors. In the case of concealed courtyard, white or black. These are also really nice dual lands. You know, the fact they enter untapped in the early game is a big deal. I think they're also a C plus. It'll be interesting to see whether or not these dual lands end up being better than the deserts are. If the desert subtype matters enough and it matters at least a little bit, it could turn out that you'd rather be playing the ones that always enter tapped because they power up enough of your cards, but they're both C pluses. I think to start the format, I would end up taking the fast lands ahead of the uh, desert dual lands, but I could see it shifting. So those are all the multicolored and colorless cards in Outlaws of Thunder Junction. Next, I'll look at all the white cards. If you wanna stay aware of when that video comes out, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. If more of the set review is out by the time you watch this, you'll see a playlist on your screen shortly. Thanks for watching.